Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, I'm Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. This is part two of the mental myths. We covered part one in the last episode, obviously. And in that, we looked at the whole factor of originality, how we look at everything and we go, we have to be original. We can't copy. And copying is the way forward. This is how most people learn. Most people have learned. And copying is the first myth that you need to break down. So whether you're doing a website, whether you're creating a website, or you're writing, or you're drawing, copying is how you have to go. This is different from plagiarism, but listen to the first episode, otherwise I would be repeating myself over again. We then moved to the second myth, and the second myth was about how we need to remember everything. At this point, you realize that your brain is nature's spam filter. It's one of the most sophisticated spam filters. It focuses on one thing and blocks everything else out. So you don't have to remember everything. In fact, you couldn't remember everything. And this is the burden that we carry, that we've read a book or we've watched a documentary and we can't remember this stuff. And we're afraid that there's something wrong with our memory. There's nothing wrong with our memory. Our school systems are designed to get you to remember everything so that you can forget it the day after the examination. It's a myth, obviously, but we're still feeling the burden. We're still feeling like we have to remember everything. And especially now when you're in business, you think that you have to read all these books and then you have to remember everything which is why people don't listen to audio. They think that they have to remember everything. They sit in events and workshops, and then they write streams of notes, and you can't remember everything, even if you write all the notes. So focus on the things that you can, one or two things, three things maybe, and that gets you ahead because you can implement that stuff. This takes us to today's episode, where we cover the third part, which is about speed, about gaining the momentum. And this is the third myth. It's that speed reading, speed, everything is better for us. And it's not. And guess who has perpetuated this myth as well? Yes, it's me. If you looked at the page, the About Us page on the Psychotactic site, it used to say that I read 100 books a year. Well, that was true when I started out in business. I didn't have many clients, so I had loads and loads of time. It was also the very early days of the internet. There were still millions of pages online, but blogs barely existed. YouTube was non-existent. Facebook was years away. If you wanted to get those 100 books, you had to physically make your way to the bookstore or, as I did, to the library. Nothing online was particularly instant, and it was certainly not as distracting as it is today. Even so, I wanted to go faster. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get all the information I could in my head. So I bought a book, actually a course, on speed reading. The course was instantly impressive. It showed me how my brain could recall just about anything it viewed, even if it was for a brief second. So it got me to open a random page of the dictionary, flick through the page, and later recall a fair bit of what was on the page. Now, this was a long time ago, 14, 15 years ago, and I forget the details of the exercise, but I was hooked into believing that I could store endless amounts of information in my head. It was true. You could store endless amounts of information in your head. 
but it wasn't information that you could use. It was more like a photocopy machine. If you think about a photocopy machine for a few seconds, then you realize the function. What is the primary function of a photocopy machine? It takes photocopies. It takes photocopies of the information. So you can run tens of thousands of pages through a photocopy machine and it just takes images. And it seems like our brains can do the same thing. However, it doesn't mean that the brain can make sense of the information. It's just information, loads of information piling up on top of more information, but like a photocopy machine. That speed reading course that I had was instantly enjoyable, and yet it was useless to me. It's still around somewhere at the back, somewhere in some drawer. Despite paying a small fortune for it, I just gave up. And I went back to reading, but not just reading a book, but reading two books a week. For someone like me who was just learning marketing, just learning about business, reading was a great idea. But it was a bit like getting to know the streets in a city. It gave me the confidence and it gave me the feel for the city. And I didn't have a fear of getting lost, which I felt a lot at the start. And this constant pounding flow of information, it's great as long as you don't have to do too much with the information. We take in information all the time. We watch the news, we read magazines, we listen to endless podcast interviews. They constitute a mountain range of information, but not information that you can necessarily use. Not information that you can use now or in the future. It's information. It's just, it's going to rain today. There is this storm coming in. There is this shift in the technology, in the economy. It's all information. Maybe we can use it, but most of the time it's just information coming at you. And I found that I was losing out on the depth. This need for me to read 100 books a year or even 25 books a year, and I was playing this game of chicken. You know, the game of chicken where two cars head towards each other and then the car that swerves first, that's the chicken. Well, I felt that I was headed right towards that other car. I was refusing to swerve. And in doing so, I was driving myself crazy and I was missing out on the nuances. To bounce back to the analogy of the city streets, what was happening is that I was getting a lot of information, but I wasn't getting enough depth. I didn't need to speed up. I could take things at a reasonable pace and even slow down. Now, when I slowed down, I noticed something quite interesting. I had missed at least 30 to 50% of the nuances in the first reading or the first listening. I remember listening to how trees absorb nutrition, for example, and I loved that podcast episode. So I heard it again, and then again, and again, and again, and the fourth time around, I was still picking up nuances. I was sitting once with my niece Marsha and we were watching David Attenborough, and I'd watched this video many times before, and even then, as I was watching it, it was like... I was watching it for the first time. I couldn't believe that I was missing out so much in the first pass or the second pass. I knew there was nothing wrong with my brain, but obviously we're all missing these nuances, which is why in the book, The Brain Audit, there is a note. There is a note right in the introduction, and it says to go back and read the book thrice. And many clients come back and say that they were surprised at how much they learned on the second or the third pass. This isn't to say that speed itself is a problem. Right now, I'm learning some nuances of InDesign and EPUB. And a lot of it, much of it, is old knowledge. I've been over the material and I could do some other things, some other activity, while listening to the video. I don't even have to look at it. I know exactly what is happening. If I know the material, I will probably get the video to run at 1.25x or even 1.5x. 
But even in these conditions, it's important not to get cocky. The material might be the same or remarkably similar, but often the presenter talks about a new way to implement the information. And if I'm just speeding things up, I will most certainly miss it. All of this speed brings up a very important question, which is about the brain. The brain has this adaptation, this pattern recognition system. So doesn't it adapt to faster speeds? Yes, it does. I believe it does. If you listen to everything at twice the speed, over time, that double speed is more likely to become the new standard for you. So technically speaking, you're saving time. Well, it's technically speaking, because it's not like you can absorb twice the amount at once. You are absorbing probably the same amount, you're just going faster. And there is a definite downside when you enter the real world. Because if you've been listening to everything at 2x, then when people speak to you, there is this slowness, like almost like I'm speaking at this pace. So if you listen to everything at high speed, normal speech might cause you to get distracted because everyone speaks so slowly and when you are distracted well now you're missing out on possibly vital information so there are these downsides but the main point is that speeding up your reading speeding up your listening doesn't necessarily make you smarter Eventually, what's the point of all the information that you've just listened to? What's the point of all the information that you've just read? It's for you to use that information in a way that helps you move ahead. But then you run into our X About Us page and there it tells you that I read 100 pages, no, 100 books a year. And that information might have been correct when I had less work or when I was more needy for information. It could have been true in an age where everyone wasn't being blasted with millions of pieces of information every single minute of the day. And for the most part, speed kills. Speed doesn't make things better or more profound. As singer-songwriter John Mayer writes in one of his songs, twice as much ain't twice as good and can't sustain as one half good. It's wanting more that's going to send me to my knees. It's a myth that you need to go faster. You can slow down, you can make notes, you can make mind maps. You can even doodle. You can go over a book once, twice or thrice if you choose to do so. Savor what you're learning and learn it in a deeper, more profound way. All this speedy stuff, it's debatable how good it is for you. And with that, we come to the end of this episode. Yes, I know it's a short episode, but well, we covered the first two parts in the last episode. And what did we cover in the last episode? The first thing is that you don't have to remember everything. We all think that we have to remember everything or we have to remember a lot and it frightens us in a way that we read a book and we can't remember quite a lot of it. We forget a lot of the details, but you remember the stories. That's very interesting that you remember the stories. So when you're writing the book, put in more stories so that your clients remember because that's what they remember, the case studies and the stories. So you remember stories, but you forget a lot of details. You have to go back, especially if there are systems and methods and information. Information is very tiring. So we're designed to forget. That's what the brain does well. That's the brain as a spam filter. The second thing is copying. Copying might seem to be like a bad thing. And plagiarism is definitely a bad thing. Someone just did it while we were writing this article, in fact. Someone took our article and put it on the Intuit site, which is the QuickBooks site. And the article had the same ideas. It had the same six questions that we tell you to ask in the brain audit. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with rewriting the content 
of someone else's book or someone else's site or some information but you have to put it in your own words and you have to as far as possible give credit to the source which this person didn't do they just put their photograph there that is plagiarism If you've listened to previous podcasts, for instance, I would have covered Good to Great by Jim Collins, and he talks about the three core principles, the hedgehog principle. Now, there's no way that I'm going to say, well, the hedgehog principle, I can't tell you anything about it, but here's what it is, A, B, and C, and I can't tell you anything about it. So I have to refer back to that book. I have to refer back to Jim Collins and to the hedgehog principle. But that is not plagiarism. That is when you're giving your own version of whatever has been taught to you or whatever you've learned. Now, copying is different. Copying is a method of learning. It's a method of construction. When you're starting up a new website, for instance, you start off by copying. When you're starting a new artwork, you start off by copying. And then you put in different layers and finally it becomes your own. That's different. And... It's a good way to create new stuff, but it's also a great way to learn. And that's how every kid learns. They copy accents, they copy walking styles, they copy the alphabet, they copy everything. That's what you and I did, and that's how we learn the fastest. So there is no shame in that. And this is a mental block that we can't copy. We have to come up with our own thing. We have to be original. Nope. It's just your voice that has to be original. It's just your tone, just your style, which will develop over time as you keep copying and adding stuff to it. And finally, we come to the third part. And in the third part, we looked at speed. And there's nothing more to be said. You have to slow down. I've slowed down. I just read 10 books, 12 books a year. I read a lot of magazines. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I watch more documentaries than I ever did when I was growing up because I didn't have any access to documentaries. And now you do. You can pick and choose the good ones. But I slow things down. I make notes. I save stuff to Evernote. I save screenshots. I slow down the entire process because I want to, and this is ironical, I want to remember and there is no way I can remember at twice the speed. So I just slow things down, and I think so should you. And with that, we come to the end of this podcast. So what's the one thing that you can do today? What I did when I was learning to write sales pages is I went out there and I printed out the sales page, I'd take a yellow marker, and then I'd mark out the sections that worked for me. And I mentioned this before, it's something that you might want to do because you're selling products, you're selling services, and you don't always realize what you're doing wrong. So when you print it out, when you put that yellow marker, orange marker, green marker, whatever marker you have, what you're doing is you're copying in a way. You're letting your brain understand which other parts that are interesting. We can do this very efficiently and we can learn a lot however there is also a landing pages workshop we're doing this in singapore if you've never been to singapore then and this is a good excuse to come to asia to enjoy yourself of course if you're in malaysia or singapore or hong kong anywhere in the area or even as far as new zealand let's do this thing in singapore this is the first week of april There are no specific dates right now because we haven't booked the venue, but we will soon be doing that. The second venue, which is the next week, we're going to be in Belgium. Possibly in Brussels. That's where we're doing the landing pages workshop. So if you're not on this side of the planet, then the other side of the planet will have to do. And that's the landing pages workshop. The workshop is about the sales page. It's about how to write that sales page in three days. Copywriters take over a week, easily over a week, to write a sales page, and they're very good at doing it. So how can you create something that can be done in three days? And you know what? The workshop is three days. So 
So it's not like some theoretical thing with a bunch of notes and videos that you take home. No, you go home with your own sales page. You write it in three days. You have people there sitting there alongside you who can audit your work. I will be there as well. Renuka will be there as well. You will get the result before you go home. That's how we work at Psychotactics. It's not about more information. Information itself is great, but the ability to transform that information into reality, into stuff that works for you, that's the amazing part. If you go to a copywriter and you ask them to do your page, it's going to cost you anywhere between 2000 to 8000 or even more, depending on the copywriter. Now, this is not to put down copywriters. I started out as a copywriter and all my life I've been a copywriter. So copywriters can learn from this as well as someone who is not considering themselves to be a copywriter. And this is the landing pages workshop or the sales pages workshop, whatever you want to call it. It's in the first and probably the second week or third week of April. First, we start off with Singapore, then we go to Brussels. Keep those dates free and we'll see you at the workshop. But right now we're just in September. But this is September and what are you going to do until April? One of the books that really help you write good sales pages, a section of the sales page, is client attractors and that product really helps you to focus on the bullets now when you look at the top of the page what you see are the headlines or the headline and as famed advertising executive founder david ogilvy said 80 percent of your advertising depends on the headline well what happens to the remaining 20 percent one of the biggest chunks, and this is what we literally start the landing pages workshop with, is the bullets, the bullets and the features and the benefits. That is one of the most critical parts of your sales page. And a lot of people just ignore it because they don't know how to do it. Because when you look at it, bullets are like headlines. They have a how and the why, and they're curious as crazy curious. And so, you want to look at Client Attractors, which is the book, and I think it will help you tremendously. So go get that book and join us in 5000 BC. I mean, 5000 BC is for introverts. It's for where you can ask your questions and you can get the answers. But there is a wealth of information in 5000 BC. Plus, it's a very safe place to be. It's not obnoxious. The motto of 5000 BC is be kind, be helpful or be gone. If you've been postponing this whole trip to 5000 BC, I think you should make your decision now. Get to 5000 BC, sign up, and we'll see you in the forum. And of course, you can access all the other information. That's me, Sean D'Souza, saying bye for now. Bye bye. Still listening? I think last week I told you about the iPad, the iPad Pro that is, and I don't think I was that excited to buy it. I bought it more because it was something to do with modern technology and I thought that it would be a good thing for Renuka because she doesn't use Photoshop that much and it has Procreate which is a really cool tool. Well, Renuka hasn't had a chance to so much as touch the iPad. She's got a few chances, but nothing much because I've been drawing cartoons the whole time and I've been writing notes on it and I'm not pushing you to get the iPad Pro. But if you're considering it in the future or you're considering it now, then I can tell you that the combination of the iPad Pro, the pencil and that keyboard that Apple gives you, it's stunning. So this is not a push towards you going out and spending all that money because it's quite expensive. It's almost like two thirds the price of a computer or a laptop. But if you are headed in that direction, then I would say get the iPad Pro and get Procreate. That's the tool that I use. I make mind maps out of it. 
I write on it, I draw on it, it's like, it's amazing. People say, oh, I don't draw cartoons. Well, the point is you can write on it, you can do stuff. Of course, you can write on a normal writing pad as well. But I think that if you're already headed there, then the iPad Pro is really cool. Now, clients keep asking, which apps do you use? And I should be doing a podcast on that. But until we do that podcast, there is this cooking app. It's called Paprika, as in P-A-P-R-I-K-A. And this is one of the most stunning pieces of software I have used in a long time. It's just so beautiful. I probably mentioned this before, but I cook a new meal almost every day. I get the feed from Pinterest and I look at what's new there and I'll just make it. However, I want to repeat certain things, you know, the meals that I really liked. And then, of course, I have to go looking for them and it's a real pain. But there are also days where I only have five or seven minutes and I want to cook a really good meal in five or seven minutes. Or I might have 30 minutes. Recipes aren't stored in a easy manner online so that you can get these five minute recipes or 30 minute recipes or get all the ingredients or when you get to the store, you can pick all the ingredients. This is a great app. I know there are lots of cooking apps out there. I know there are lots of these kind of apps, but try Paprika. I have it both on the computer, on the Mac, and on the iPhone, but I believe it's available for Android and for Windows. So check it out. I think you really like it. I love it. I mean, three things have happened in this one year. The i3, which is the BMW i3, that I fell in love with. That was a year ago. And now, in one month, it's been the iPad Pro, and it's the Paprika. So, yeah, I know everything about technology. I'll go take a walk on the beach. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already left a review on iTunes, do that. And let's see you in 5000 BC. Bye for now.